Welcome back to Asia Talk. Again, we're here with Sarah Cook talking about Gao Zhishen and his book, A China More Just. Sarah, tell us about Gao's upbringing. You talked about him growing up in a cave, which is something that you know most of us have no uh, way to kind of relate to that. It's, was he very poor growing up? He was, and I actually looked this up online. There are actually people who live in caves in Shanxi province, and you can see photos of them if you Google it on Google Images. Still today? Yeah, still today. They, I mean, they look kind of like they're not as primitive as we maybe think of somebody living in a cave, but it does actually exist. Um, and he comes from a very poor background, and I think actually I'll probably read a part of this, the book right now and let him tell his own okay. story. <laughs> yeah. um, and this is actually how the book opens. This is actually the opening of the book. I was born in 1964 in the countryside of northern Shanxi province. Chinese people were poor in those days, but our family was even poorer than most. I remember my father often sitting beside the cooking pit and grumbling to himself, when, we will, when will we ever have enough to eat? My father passed away when I was only 10. We had no money during his stay in the hospital. After he died, they wouldn't let us have the body because our family owed the hospital $10. That was a lot of money back then. But we were fortunate in that my school teacher's older brother, who was a local party secretary, helped by agreeing to be our guarantor to the hospital. In the end, we were able to take my father's body home. From then on, our family had nothing. So that's a pretty, uh, pretty sober, pretty, uh, pretty harsh life. Sounds like. Yeah, I mean, for me, as somebody who grew up, you know, middle-class America, it's very humbling to see the background that he came from. I mean, there were seven kids, and from a very young age, he had to go on work. And one of the things he talks about, one of the passages I thought I'd also read is where he's actually talking about working in a coal mine, which is something that most, I certainly have never done, and that when you think about later on the cases that he's taken defending people who are in coal mines or helping their families, you kind of understand where that came from. Um, when I turned 15, my brother and I got part-time jobs working as coal miners at the Huangling Coal Mine in Shanxi. Now, whenever I learn of a coal mine accident, it reminds me of the conditions we once worked under. Society today pays attention when mining accidents occur and urges the employers to do something. But in those days, such accidents were usually just dismissed. The death of a human being back then was considered about as important as the death of an ant. As, as someone who's spent a lot of time studying, one of the things that's really incredible, and he talks about the difficulties he had to go through just to go to school. Mm -hmm. His mom would stay up all night because they, nobody in the village, not just them, but nobody in the village had a clock. And so she would stay up and pay, you know, know the time based on the stars. So she would get up a few times in the middle of the night to wake him up at like 4 o'clock in the morning so he could get to school in time. Um, and on cloudy nights, he says that she didn't sleep at all because you couldn't really see the stars all that clearly. Uh, and he, it's just incredible. I mean, he'd spend three hours a day. He says he's walked something like 6,000 miles in his three years of middle school, just going back and forth to school every day. That is quite an amazing story and yeah. kind of shows the, the perseverance that he had to go through. Now, how did he become a lawyer? How did he go from you know, working in a coal mine to practicing law? Um, that's one of my favorite parts of the book, I have to say, because he talks about how he was selling vegetables on the street, streets of Xinjiang in northwestern China, and I guess what they used to do is that instead of using, because they didn't have plastic bags, they'd wrap the vegetables in newspaper. And so somebody threw aside one of the pieces of newspaper because they didn't need it. And there was an advertisement there that China was looking to train 150,000 lawyers. This was around 1980 or so, a little in the mid-80s. So it mm -hmm. was very soon after Mao had died, and it was the beginning of the opening up and kind of the reform era that a lot of people call. Um, and he basically saw it and was like, you know what, I'll teach myself law. And he, he talks about how he then just went out and got the books, um, worked bit by bit, would like read a book everywhere he went when he was walking with him, he was on the bus, passed the exam on his first try, and then went on to study for the bar exam, which, in, I mean, here we think about the bar exam as being something very difficult to do. Right. But in China, and anybody, you know, you talk to Chinese people, even now, the, the competition for places just in university is tremendously high. So there was like odds of like one out of 100 or five out of 500 people that would pass the bar exam. And so he and a bunch of friends, for a few cents a night, um, rented this uh, apartment. And they would stay up all night studying. And then he would get up at 5 o'clock in the morning, splash some water in his face, and go to work, go back to selling vegetables or whatever he was working on. Um, and he actually passed the bar exam on his first try. 
So, so that, appa that, apparently has like this phenomenal memory, which is I guess the only way you can possibly do that. I mean, that shows quite a level of, of determination, I have to say, and it really kind of makes him see. I, I also felt that kind of part of the book really uh, showed how he he stuck out from some of the other people who were practicing law or who were learning law at the time. So that's perfect for us to go into uh, some of his first cases, and really he started to uh, distinguish. He was very different from the beginning. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I think one of the things that Gao Din, he talks about in the book, is that from the beginning he's like, a third of the cases I take are going to be pro bono. Um, and so he really started doing that, and the word spread about that very quickly. One of the first cases he took and he won was this medical malpractice suit for a little boy who'd lost his hearing. He was in the hospital and they gave him too much penicillin or mm -hmm. some other kind mm -hmm. of drug and he lost his hearing. He came from a very poor background in northeastern China. Um, and the kid's grandmother, and so he was deaf, and the kid's grandmother tried to get compensation for him. Um, and he, she, she wasn't able to, and they tried to hire a few lawyers, but nobody was willing to help. And she ends up getting to this, um, getting to Beijing somehow, and talking to this lawyer's newspaper. Mm -hmm. And they advertised that they're looking for someone to take this case. And Gao was the only lawyer in all of China who would take a completely pro bono. Um, there were other lawyers who, would, who wanted compensation for the transportation. Uh, and so he starts working with this kid. He tells the whole story here. I, I won't ruin it for our viewers. <laughs> you can, um, and it's, it's, it's an incredible story that he tells about it. And he won the largest medical malpractice suit. He won $100,000 for this little boy. What people said was an unwinnable case. Yeah, I mean, it was basically that at some point the hospital was like, we'd rather pay a million dollars to our lawyers to beat you than give you a million dollars of compensation. That's, that's quite... Uh, and that's, yeah. I mean, that's one of the things that Gal expresses a lot of frustration, and that's part of his frustration at the system. And he was actually interviewed afterwards by some media in China, and they report on it quite a bit, so that's how he started becoming really known nationwide. Uh, and they, they would ask, and he would, they would ask him what he thought about the case. And he was like, look, I'm in a, I won the case, so I think I'm in a position to comment. And he really expressed his frustration about, well, why was anybody helping this kid to begin with? Why did he have to take six or nine years of litigation to get this? Why was the, at some point, the first lawyer that the boy had switched sides and was then helping the hospital and was up against Gao Jishan. Um So he's like, why did that happen? What does this say about our system, about... Um, the legal system itself and the corruption of, of, of the endemic corruption everywhere. So, you, so you, you really see his frustration at that. Um, and, and with the national media exposure came more and more people turning to him, asking them for help. Um, people coming from across the country looking for the lawyer Gao Zhishang. Mm -hmm. uh, and at some point in 2001, the Ministry of Justice held this like legal debate competition. Mm -hmm. And Gao actually came out one of the top ten lawyers in China. And so that was also aired on television and um, everybody started to know the name Gao Zhishan. So that seems quite uh, to be a high point in his career. And he talks about uh, one of the things in the book is he talks about how people would come and find him somehow, even though they would be like, oh, you know, uh, I just know that the name of the lawyer, and I just know the province where he's from, but no other information. And he, they would still find him for his cases. So that really, uh, I think, shows to me how much he stood out in that, in that environment. But, yeah, yeah, I mean, you saw him as being, he was somebody who would, was generous and a lawyer who was really standing on principle and justice was very important to him and he would help anybody. It was completely, and that, you see that later on as he moves on, is that any, even some of the most, you know, the most persecuted groups in China, he'll, he'll help them because he thinks everybody, you know, has a right to equality before the law. Um, and there, there is that story that you mentioned where he gets a phone call one day because there's some banner in the middle of a room chi in Xinjiang that's asking for lawyer Gao Zhisheng because his family came looking for him. So It's quite, it's quite an amazing story, mm. and uh, we'll leave the rest for people to read in the book, but when we come back from this break, we're going to talk about uh, kind of a pivotal moment in, in Gao's life and how he went from this high of being this uh, lawyer that was you know, recognized by the Ministry of Justice to being uh, persecuted himself and his family. So stay tuned, we'll be right back with Asia Talk.